Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, come back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Kemp Powers. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. My name is Kemp Powers. I am the one of the three directors of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. All right. So you grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Can you tell us how it was growing up? I mean, I was born in 1973, so most of my formative childhood in Brooklyn was in the 80s. So, you know, it wasn't a... It's so funny because Brooklyn back then, like you didn't leave Brooklyn very much. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like going into, we call Manhattan the city. And if I'm being honest, I mean, I, I might go into the city once a year, usually like on a school trip. So okay. like you kind of didn't leave Brooklyn and no one who wasn't from Brooklyn came to Brooklyn. So my best description of it was, I'd never heard the term until years later, but I guess we were like townies, you know what I'm saying? Like we, yeah. we really did kind of like your block was like kind of how you defined uh, your existence. Um, and like when I was very young, we were we were in Coney Island. But when, when I was pretty little, we moved to Flatbush, which okay. was where I spent most of my formative years. I'd say Flatbush and then for a part of it, um, Kensington, um, which is like basically like five, like the neighborhoods going around. Uh, Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 1980s Brooklyn was, um, it was just a few years after the city had been bankrupt. So it was kind of like really, really high crime, um, really, really kind of run down. But it was through kind of like this, the, the crack epidemic happened. It was kind of like through this destitution that a lot of kind of amazing art emerged from the city. Um, you know, you were getting everything from like punk rock music to to hip hop and street art. And it, it was kind of a, a, a flourishing time um, as, a, as a young person, because New York really did feel like um, it really did feel like the whole universe. You know what I'm saying? It was kind of like right. <laughs> it, it's like, you know, it's like who cares what everyone else is doing or listening to all that matters. It's kind of like what we're doing um, in, in New York. That, so, that is very New Yorker. I I, I feel yeah. that from y'all. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's different now. I mean, I'm not even trying to pretend like it's it's anything like that now. But uh -huh. I hate to say like you had to have been there. But like if you were there and you'd experience it, it was like it, like every like on summer sometimes like you, we would go down south for the summer. Like newsflash, if you were black and born and raised in New York, you were one of two things. Either you were from the Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. probably Jamaican, mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? Or you were one generation removed from the South. Right. And in New York in particular, a lot of us, our parents were from North Carolina. So okay. what happens is over the summer, inevitably every now and then over the summer, they send your ass down South for the summer, <laughs> which, and, and, and again, at this time it was like, we're talking like extreme, you know, like to be put on an Amtrak train and go down to North Carolina and go to stay at like an aunt or an uncle's house. Mm -hmm. And like, to put it like the bath that we had like an outhouse down there, like right. straight up, there wasn't a bathroom in the house. <laughs> so to go from like the middle of Brooklyn and then summer, like in the middle of the night, if you got to go, you got to like hold it because you don't <laughs> want to go out because you're scared because right. the, ne the nearest neighbor is a mile away. And when it's time to take a bath, there's like a wash bin in the living room and they pour boiling water and cold water and you're like in the room. So when you do go back home to New York, it makes you want to leave the city even less. Because <laughs> in my juvenile mind, uh, it was New York or the rest of the world were people in outhouses. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and like picking butter beans and, and making succotash for dinner and fried apples. And I was like, nah, I want pizza. You know what I'm saying? I want White Castle. I like my I like my existence in in this city, but you know, yeah. it's uh, your 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 horizons expand over time and in right. the world. But as a young person, you very much you don't see New York as bad at all. Quite the opposite, you mm -hmm. see it as like you can't be um, anywhere else. Right. So, what are you, some of your best childhood memories? I know you did theater as a kid and stuff so well i went to yeah i mean theater theater was kind of like the new york backdrop it was like a thing mm -hmm. you 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 experience whether you really wanted to or not um and, and at first i was kind of like resistant to it but once i was exposed to theater um both through school and and through my mom 
I, I really loved it like at a young age. So it's something that like I always had an appreciation and love of theater from Broadway musicals to Shakespeare. You know, the, the first Broadway play I saw was my mom took me to La Caja Faux, which is mm -hmm. like the birdcage, you know, which was, I thought was like funny and charming, you know, especially at a time in the city, like back then, there was like so much like homophobia to like an mm. extreme violent level in the yeah. city. And, um, you know, so, so much of my openness to the world and to different people came from my exposure, just a different way of thinking, I think came from my exposure to, to theater. I mean, obviously Shakespeare always, and a lot of his work deals with pretty timeless um, themes. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think theater was that thing that, allowed me to not just be like a kid on a block who doesn't give a shit and actually develop some, I'd say, um, artistic curiosity. Yeah. Um, and, and that really contributed to kind of like who I am. Um, what is your cultural makeup? That's not to say just what's your ethnicity, but what is the culture of where you grew up and the uniqueness of where you're from? Yeah, I mean, I describe people, like I tell people I'm just a normal ass black dude. You know what I mean? Like there's no... <laughs> There's a, both my parents um, are, are from the South. Um, you know, my, my mom is from, um, and my dad are, are both from North Carolina. You know, my mom's from um, Little Washington. Um, and my, we, we actually still have family land um, down near Roanoke Rapids. So mm -hmm. we, were, we were the, I am the classic product of great migration, mm -hmm. you know, Southern country people moving up to the city and building a, a new life. Like, it's funny because when you, I don't really have an accent. And a lot of right. people told me that since I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. That's largely because my mother corrected my pronunciation from when I was a real little kid. So mm -hmm. if I mispronounced a word, she would like pretty, you know, sternly correct me. So I didn't even notice I didn't have an accent. Like, I thought I sounded like all my friends. Right. So, and, and and at a certain point, I think I was in like seventh grade, where one of my friends was like, "Damn, why don't you have an accent?" I'm like, "I don't have a, like what accent? I don't hear no one because I didn't hear their accent." Right. You know what I'm saying? So it was just one of those. I mean, you you hear a little bit every now and then if I'm really upset or really uh -huh. fast. That's but, usually when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, when you get like really emotional and you kind of mm -hmm. go into your um how do I call it? Like you're almost like primordial self where you're mm -hmm. just like you black out from emotion. Then you, then you hear a little bit of it, but it's not strong. But the thing about the New York accent is there's different ethnicities have different accents, right? So there's like a New York accent. That's like an Italian New York accent. There's mm -hmm. a New York Jewish accent and there's a New York black accent. Right. So like black Americans in New York, if you hear my and sister. then it's borough by borough too. Yes, so. if you hear my sisters or my uncles or my aunts or most of my family, they have a thick, like you know, New York black New York um, accent. But it's mm -hmm. it's very um, it's interesting that other than a few expressions, I always had what my teachers described as a as a non regional you know accent. They were like you know you could be like a newscaster. Um, yeah. So you know, of course, when you're young, that manifests itself as oh, you sound white. You know, <laughs> yeah. but I think that that's kind of like a I think that's kind of like a more of an antiquated thing. I think that's I'm, I'm actually kind of glad to see that that's kind of gone away and mm -hmm. the kids of all ethnicities, including black kids. It's more acceptable for them to sound all different kinds of ways now. But it was less so when I was younger and people right. would, would point it out that way. But but I'm not going to even front and act like if I heard that, I'd be like, oh, I'm so sad. Like, I didn't give a fuck. So. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not I'm not going to pretend like that was some kind of emotional <laughs> scarring thing. If someone was like, you sound white. And I'm like, you're getting three S. So, you know, <laughs> at one at McDonald's. like I was very big about like, I will come back right? and, and throw it in. That's how you survive. Yeah. You just throw some other insult back at a person. You know, it wasn't it was a, again, it was kind of an era that like when I when I describe my, my youth to people, I'm like, look, I'm not going to front. I was just a little black nerd. But I was mm -hmm. like understand a little black nerd in the 80s would cut you you know what i mean like it's not like a little black nerd in a suburb i was a little black nerd in brooklyn which right. was like still dangerous to your average person who wasn't from new york because you have and, and i wasn't a tough thing it was like you have defense mechanisms yeah you, know? it, you said it it's it's really about like survival like mm -hmm. you 
getting from your front door to school, which usually involves a subway ride. And this is a subway ride at a time when like the only people you saw on subways were like other kids, knuckleheads, guardian angels, an occasional cop. No one was on the subway after dark. Like after dark, if you went down to the subway, it was like a science fiction movie. So you pretty much expected to get robbed. Right. So navigating that world where if you got a nice clean pair of shoes, you want to just make it to school with your shoes still on your feet. You know, I considered it like a point of pride. They're like, I, ain't, I never got robbed. I never got mugged. You know what I mean? Like I navigated it and like, yeah. dare I say, kept all my clothes on. You know what I'm saying? Like no one, no, one, it wasn't like a. You know, occasionally someone will be like, it'll run your shit. You know what I mean? And, and it was like, pew, like, you know, right. you, you, I'm a runner, I'm a track star. Yeah, you have some agility, <laughs> you have the ability to escape. You know, everyone got jumped every now and then, but you know, mm -hmm. that's just kind of um I'm I'm not trying to say it was right or wrong, but it was just that was just the the reality. I but I was mm -hmm. definitely more of a bookworm, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I spent a lot of time in the library. Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, like I said, I love theater. Um, mm -hmm. I, took a, I took a huge interest um, in, in, in lots of things that um, some of my peers weren't into. But again, if I'm being completely honest, that's another like trope that I always hate that like if you if you care about these things, you are ostracized by your own community. And that's not really had been my experience. Like if, my, if I had like a friend who was a knucklehead, they weren't like, oh, you're into your books. Like, no, it was never that way. It was like, oh, this is my buddy and he's a smart one. You know what I mean? Like, it was, right. it was never a kind of like your friends discouraged you from. And again, I'm not saying that in my, this is my personal experience. This isn't a right. universal thing. But, you know, like I, I, I live, I lived in, I've always lived in, in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, for me, you know, I've always seen the, 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 like, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say there's some people, sometimes when a person's black and they grow up in all white neighborhoods, you can develop a fear of black neighborhoods mm, that yeah. rivals the fear white people have of black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand where that fear could come from because when mm -hmm. you're on the outside, it must seem like just, you know, hell on earth, but having grown up in black neighborhoods, whether right. it be, you know, Flatbush when I was a kid. I mean, now I live in, you know, Baldwin Hills View Park here in L.A., mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, are nice neighborhoods, but they're predominantly black. Right. You know, it, it's it's all there's all all these things exist in our communities, you know. Right. And so I, I, I yeah, I, I guess it's just that. um, Yeah, I, I've always I actually start feeling uncomfortable if I don't see any black people for like you know when I decided to go to Howard and when yeah. I went to Howard you know it was it was wild like we didn't leave campus for like the first couple of weeks because we were um kind of like doing trying to get adjusted to being in college making new friends mm -hmm. and the first time I remember the first time we left campus we went down to the Smithsonian because uh part of the reason I wanted to go to Howard truth be told was I wanted to see the Smithsonian I was really into museums and I was like, they're all free. So I want to go to a school near these museums I've read about and heard about. Um, and um, the first time we left campus, it was funny like to hop off the train and we realized we hadn't seen white people in like three weeks. <laughs> kind of jarring, you know what I mean? We were all, all like, right. all right, we forgot that like, <laughs> we you know what I mean? The world with these people. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it wasn't like, again, my, my, my friend group as a young man was very multi-ethnic, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, back then, most white people in Brooklyn back then were either Italian or or Jewish mm -hmm. or, or a few Russians. But like that was white people back then. There was like there was no gentrification yet. Let's put it that way. So, yeah. you know, my my friend group um, was like, you know, black kids, Puerto Rican kids, you know, Italian kids, you know, and and our respective communities would ultimately have their own tensions, you know, and there'd be lots of kind of like, there was a lot of race fighting back back mm -hmm. then. You know, Howard Beach happened, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Yusuf Hawkins, all, all those things were happening as, as I was growing up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in school, we all went to the same schools. Cause another thing is that public education was, was kind of like, that was like the best public school had ever been. You know right, what I mean? Right. The, yeah. the, the um, achievement gap was at its closest 
oddly enough, in the 80s, before politicians kind of like defanged public schools and basically resegregated them to the point where now they're as segregated as they are in the 19 as they were in the 1960s. But yeah. in the 1980s, you went to school and everybody was at school. Like private school was really just like Catholic school for some people. But mm -hmm. but most kids, middle because and the middle class is bigger. So most middle class to lower middle class kids of all races, we were kind of stuck with each other. So regardless of what racial things were going on in the city of which there were many, we still all kind of grew up together. Yeah. We just didn't go over each other's houses that much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it was that yeah. was real. Like you can't. You know, you, so if you you have some friends who were Italian and it's like, you know, they don't want black or Puerto Rican kids on their block, you know, their parents. Yeah. And that's the other strange, interesting thing is like so much of the hatred was coming from the parents. Right. You know, yeah. it was really coming from the parents. So. What can yeah. you say about your experience at Howard? Um, It was I mean, it was formative. It was a, it was a really formative experience. I mean, I didn't graduate um, like many people. You know, I left um, early. Um, mm -hmm. I could, honestly, I just couldn't afford it uh, oh, at a certain point because yeah. um, I was kind of there on my own volition, um, mm -hmm. taking out loans. Um, but despite you know that, I it, it was probably one of the most formative periods in my life. That's why I think that's why I speak so much and so positively about um, black colleges because. Yeah. Look, when I first told some people I was going to Howard, I had white friends who didn't even know what that was. Right. They were like, you're going to Harvard? And they were, I'm like, no, I'm going to Howard. And they're like, ah, ha, 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 that's not like a real school. But yeah. that that kind of diss back then over time, I've really come to view schools like Howard and Hampton and Morehouse and Spelman as important and transformative for young Black people as Harvard in Princeton and some of the Ivy League schools mm -hmm. have been for 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 everyone. And a lot of it is that there's this intangible thing um, mm -hmm. when you go to Howard. Like, look, coming out, when, when I was coming out of high school, um, you know, I was at a point, I was a, I was a pretty good student. I was mostly taking AP courses, like advanced mm -hmm. placement courses. And mm -hmm. um, it, I think it was my sophomore year in high school, my mom moved us down to Virginia. So I had to finish my last two years of school in Virginia. That okay. was a, that was a real culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, stunning culture shock because it was a situation where my school in New York was um, Edward R. Murrow High School. Um, very, very diverse. Very, very good school. My school in Virginia was Warwick High School, um, which was about 87 percent black. Mm -hmm. So that was actually the first time I went to a school that was like almost all one race. And you saw the in like. Let me put it this way. You go to I was going to school at Morrow and like college days, you'd see the various universities and colleges with tables kind of like giving out information for the students. Yeah. And like Princeton would be there at Morrow. Harvard mm -hmm. would be there. You know, you'd have the city universities, you have NYU, you have Columbia, you have Rutgers, you have when they did college, I don't even want to call it college days at my high mm -hmm. school in Virginia, because you know what it was? Army, Navy, Marines. Yeah. And it wasn't like even the Air Force wasn't there because we weren't smart enough to be in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So that really caught me off guard. So yeah. I found myself in a school that was almost 90 percent black, being one of only one or two black kids in almost every advanced course. Mm -hmm. So that was wild to me because like there were other black kids in New York at a more diverse school where there were fewer of us. But in this predominantly black school all the advanced courses that I took in English and history and everything like that, I was looking around and I'm like, where'd everybody go? Suddenly. Right. So um, by the time I got out of that high school, I had switched my thinking. Um, when I was younger, when I was in New York, I was really kind of hoping to go to like an Ivy League school like everyone else. Mm, okay, okay. But mm. after going to Virginia and a couple of years down there, and, and it was a it was a difficult time down there for me, like a lot of, um, you know, the, I had teachers, some were cool, but a lot of them were I felt were very harsh towards me. And yeah. uh, the ones I felt were harshest were black teachers. Mm. Um, it was kind of this. Um, I guess they saw my attitude as uppity. Mm, OK, so the way I guess I got a more nuanced vision of race. Yeah. Uh, within my own community and kind of like 
self-loathing on on display and again i'm not trying to indict anybody like that it's just it's just how i perceive things because right. ultimately the impact it had on me is that by the time i graduated from high school i went from like i want to go to an ivy league school to like i want to go to a black school mm -hmm. because i i graduated feeling like an an outsider like mm -hmm. i didn't have a community like it was while i was in virginia that it was it suddenly became weird that i didn't just listen to hip-hop but I also listen to Sting. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like all of a sudden being for a while, at least being black had a very narrow definition and these are black things and these are white things. And, and I, I got, I really kind of rebelled against that. So honestly, I just wanted to go to a black school because I wanted to be around other black kids like me. You yeah. know what I mean? I just wanted to be around other black kids who there were all different kinds of black kids, including I remember like the first week in my dorm and like we, we, dude I met and kind of went down a rabbit hole talking about the Sting album, Dream of the Blue Turtles. And I'm like, great. You know what I mean? Like I knew, I knew I wasn't the only one <laughs> right. to like reconvince myself that I yeah. was the only one. So I was really going for the, um, the camaraderie. And mm -hmm. also I, I was kind of feeling really insecure um, at 17 years old. And I just wanted to know that like, look, if I fail, if I don't do well, I, I know it's because I haven't tried hard enough. I know it has nothing to do with my race. Yeah. And at Howard, that was the case. You know what I mean? Like, if, if something's not going right, you can't be like, oh, it's because I'm black. You guys like, nope, nope. That's We're all in the same boat. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, D.C. is like a prominently black city. And, um, and yeah, I just, I just kind of, I needed that in my life at, at mm -hmm. the time. And that's not to say that as a black college is for every black person. I think mm -hmm. some people will thrive at you know an ivy league school people thrive at, at states like neither of my kids um went to black i mean my son's in college now he's mm -hmm. at san francisco state um my daughter went to arizona state and graduated mm -hmm. from there magna cum laude and they were very happy like it's you know it's it's just we're all different my kids yeah. are not me the world is a different place for them than it was for me so it's very much like where i was in my life and where the world was um, I wanted to have that feeling of community that I, I don't think could be replicated. And, and like some mm -hmm. of my friends from freshman year of college are, are still friends of mine to this day. You, you know what I mean? And that's the other thing about college. The, the, a lot of the bonds you make in college are going to be some of your real lifetime bonds. Like I have one or two friends from like fifth or fourth grade um, <laughs> who we still talk to every now and then, but our worlds have kind of gone in different directions, but we're still friends. But I have a lot more friends from college. Yeah. We check in, we talk, we see each other. Like that, that's my peer group. And and some of them are artists and I follow their careers and they follow mine. And it was kind of mm -hmm. like, these are the people you end up working with. And and I'm not alone in that. I'm sure you could speak to a lot of people who went to the Howards and the Morehouses and the Hamptons. And I have a lot of friends who went to other black colleges and we met as young adults. And that was also connecting tissue. You know, yeah. like one of my closest friends, Ram, went to Hampton. So it started as this kind of like, which one is the real HU <laughs> right. kind of competitive thing. And, and we've been, and part of it is like becoming close friends over the years is even though he didn't go to Howard and I didn't go to Hampton, we know there's kind of like a shared black college experience. So yeah. if from Hampton or, or, you know, Florida A&M, you, know, you know what I mean? Or, or Morgan state, like you just kind of know that, that there's like an, un, un, it's not necessary. It's like an unspoken um, understanding. Of, of certain things and, and like to speak because earlier you mentioned like people's thought of the um validity of like hbcus uh today i saw um an article where this woman just graduated from or uh, just took the bar she's mm -hmm. a famu law grad and she got such a high score that she's automatically eligible to pla practice law in like 41 states wow, so wow. that's an hbcu law grad yeah i mean it's it is it's it's unfortunate that i think people some and sometimes they still do think that somehow we're getting some kind of lesser education which is kind of absurd because look at the success rate of those of us who've gone to mm -hmm. to some you know to to a lot of these schools i mean look at i mean even like use use hollywood as an example i mean the you know there's uh, the the only, to my knowledge, uh, the first um, and only black man who's been nominated for an Oscar for cinematographer is Bradford Young, who was a few years behind me at Howard. 
you know, <laughs> like it's uh it's one of those things where it's like, you know, that just the Howard people alone, you know, you got, you know, yeah. Charles King over at Macro, obviously, you know, the late chat with Bozeman, like there's, mm -hmm. there's just like, you know, whether graduate or just came through, you know, like Diddy, Diggable, like it was people who have, a, you know, uh, an entrepreneurial creative spirit, mm -hmm. a lot of determination. Again, it's not for everyone, but if you have a certain kind of like resolve and makeup, yeah, um, it can be really empowering to go to uh, an HBCU because mm -hmm. as opposed to a lot of the world telling you to humble yourself and what you can't do. Um, right. It was really refreshing for me to be at an HBCU and any idea I came up with, none of them seemed crazy. It was instead like, well, why can't you do that? Why shouldn't you, you, you know, do that? And, you know, my freshman year, me and my buddy started a comic book company. And we like publish independent comics for like several years out of our yeah. Day. flatline comics. Can you yeah, we like published. It? We got distribution. Like we were we were in comic stores around the country. It was a small press run, you know, twenty, you know, no more than twenty thousand copies of an issue. But like the fact that we were like in Drew Hall, mm -hmm. in our form, you know, doing this is is kind of like wow. I can't believe we were just just. You know what, guys? Let's you know we don't we're not seeing superheroes we want to see. Well, let's make some up. Let's um. How do we? How many comic books did y'all come up with? Um, there were several series. I'd say a okay. grand total. We we probably published around ten issues over a couple of years. Um, I have them in a trunk somewhere in my in my garage. Um, I mean, where you're at now, they're probably gonna be collectibles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's just funny how that that works because it was just like a lot of us. The reason the company kind of went away was largely that like people had to just like get back to their schoolwork, and in some cases, you know, parents are like, "I didn't send you to college to make comic books," and you know, it wasn't people's majors. You know, I was yeah. majoring in English. Like, I didn't. I was writing for the Hilltop, which is the student newspaper. Yeah. So you know, I I was my 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 move into a professional life was journalism, you know, mm -hmm. like none of us really kind of thought that that, that was necessarily what we're going to do. And it's, it's kind of a funny, interesting turn of events that so many of us do. Like my, my buddy, Doug Kearney, you know, he was into poetry and he's, you know, studying poetry. And it's like, what are you going to do with that? Right. And it's like, he's like a poet. He teaches poetry. He's a tenured professor teaching poetry at a university. He's won all these national awards. Like, it's just like, wow, it could be basket weaving. And if you have right. passion for it and, and you can and do it well enough and have perseverance, it's amazing how you can kind of build an, a, a really fulfilling um, creative life for yourself or a yeah. business life or whatever kind of life you, you want to have for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it's just, it's just been it's been an interesting journey to see where, where so many of us have have ended up. Yeah. Um. So you were a journalist for 17 years. How does your journalistic background help you in script writing? Um, maybe you can use your story from one night in Miami to go into that, but. Um, sure. I mean, look, I, I, part, part of what I think makes me distinct as a screenwriter um, is the amount of, you would call it in screenwriting research, but I call it reporting. And yeah. it's the amount of pre-writing reporting that I do before I write any script. I don't mm -hmm. care what the script is about. I'm not just talking about historical. It could be a, a Western. It could be a script about, you know, aliens. And there's inevitably a, a huge research component that goes into it. And, and I've said a number of times to people that I think I spend more time, significantly more time researching than I do writing the first draft. You know, I research and I outline a lot, like a lot. And mm -hmm. as I'm outlining, it reveals other things that I don't have answers to, which then kind of drives me to research more. And that all comes from reporting. I mean, one night in Miami, if I were still a journalist, that was meant to be a book. Like mm -hmm. I had found out about this very real night, um, you know, in, in 1964, where um, Cassius Clay, before he became Muhammad Ali, he beat Sonny Liston. And instead of partying, he went to a hotel room with three of his friends, Jim Brown, the football player, Sam Cooke, the musician, and Malcolm X, the, the civil rights leader. And the next mm -hmm. morning, when he announced to the world he was in the Nation of Islam. And that was right. like, wait a minute. These four guys, like I knew, I knew Ali and Malcolm X and their connection, but I was really intrigued by the athlete and the musician. And, mm -hmm. and I was really into Sam Cooke. 
like to me, Sam Cook was kind of the, the person that I, I wanted. That was like my way into the story. And I started doing this research with the idea of writing a book about the connections between these four men. Nice. Uh, and, and I did research for a few years about it. And, and I kind of bumped up against a few walls, like namely, I wasn't really sure what they discussed in the room. Yeah. That, which was the catalyst night. I only had, I know what happened afterwards. I know what happened before, but that was really kind of stymieing me. And the other, the other thing that was kind of frustrating was as a journalist, a working journalist, a young working journalist, because I was in my um, 20s at this time, mm -hmm. um, I would kind of put my feelers out to see if anyone was interested in a book like this. And people really weren't. And mm -hmm. a lot of what uh, the feedback, right or wrong, the feedback that I was getting at the time was like, these aren't the types of books that a young journalist gets to write. These are the kinds of books that like an academic writes, you know, okay. the professor. And it's like, oh man, like I'm being frozen out. It's just something I'm passionate about. So right. yeah, research kind of just like went into a box. Like it was literally a box that, that just was like all my research. And it was, it was like, um, yeah, it was just like a, like a regular ass box. And I kind of like slid it in the closet yeah. alongside all my reporting I'd done for articles. And that was it. And as fate would have it, you know, my journalism career started winding down and my creative writing career started building up. You know, he it was after I moved to Los Angeles. So I was at a, a tiny theater company um, called Rogue Machine Theater. Um, mm -hmm. the it was on Pico Boulevard in La Brea, which was like across from Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles and a few blocks from where I lived, my apartment at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I started writing a lot. I mean, I'm not an actor. I've never been a performer. Um, so, um, I would do a lot of like 24 hour play festivals and short plays. My love of theater was kind of like finally realizing itself a bit because, you know, I didn't study theater. The only thing I've ever studied is I've studied screenwriting um, okay. in Michigan, um, when I was doing a sabbatical, um, from, from my, one as of my a job. night fellow. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I was a night fellow at Michigan and I'm actually, it's funny because I'm actually going to teach a class at Michigan next year. Nice. Um, that's I'm from of, Michigan. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be teaching screenwriting for for a semester at um, University of Michigan in the fall. So nice. I don't even think it's been announced yet. So, but but yeah, that's the that's the plan. So um so yeah so um you know I I was writing a lot and people were really like getting into my my writing as a like a emerging playwright and the artistic director of the theater I was like, do you have any ideas for a full length play? And I was like, actually, I do. I said, you know, there's this incredible night that happened. I told him about, uh, you know, he's like, wow, that sounds amazing. What's it called? And I was like, one night in Miami. Like, I literally just like, pulled, <laughs> I pulled that title out of my ass. Conversation. I was like, one night in Miami. Like, yeah, sure. And uh, he was like, I'd love to read it. So, you know, when you, if you ever write it. So I basically just like went home and, and wrote a first draft. I mean, the first draft I wrote really quickly because like I said, I had a decade's worth of research. Yeah. So I kind of like beat it out. It probably took me about eight weeks to write the first draft. Um, and then I did a, um, a a private like reading at the theater with some actors and it was terrible. Like it was just, it was one of those things where like the actors, as soon as they are saying the lines out loud, you're just like, I don't even need to get notes because I know what's wrong. You know what I mean? It's like, I tell people in order to get to good writing, you have to get through a lot of bad writing. Yeah. So, that in, and that's no matter how good a writer you think you are. But I just remember that first reading. I was like, oh, man, maybe this isn't a good idea. But I, I made a lot of notes. You know, I was given a lot of notes from like friends and people who were there. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go and revise it um, and go back to the drawing board. Um, it took me a long time to get to the second draft. I think it was like a year. And it mm. was largely because um, my, my oldest sister died pretty suddenly at that time and i just didn't want to write for a while like i was just kind of like i, I took a little bit of a a creative writing break because i just had yeah. a lot of stuff on my mind but after like six seven months um i kind of pulled it back out that's the other thing with me that i realized is that when i write a draft the more time i can put between drafts the better it is for it because when i step away from a piece of my own writing um over time i come back with like a great clarity yeah and i'd made a bunch of notes but like i came back and just read the draft after seven, eight months and was like, yes. And just like tore it to pieces, uh, wrote, a, wrote another draft. Um, and then um, 
we, I think we, the reading we did then was actually up in, it was at the Classical Theater of Harlem. We, um, you know, uh, a friend of mine who, who was, you know, running that place asked if I wanted to do a public reading. Uh, we did a, we did a public reading up there. It was pretty funny because they got like the wrong date on the flyers and they tried to correct it. But I was like, you know, it's like, how many people are going to show up to the reading? They're like, oh, these readings usually have like 150 people. And I was like, oh, it's going to be great. And it was like, 25 people there. Um, so, but it was fun because two reasons. One, we it was in the all we did it in the Autobahn ballroom. So the mm -hmm. reading is the place where Malcolm X got shot and killed. Mm. And um, and those 25 people really dug it. I mean, among the people I met were the director was Carl Cofield, and Carl's become a friend and collaborator. We worked together. Carl just directed my most recent play, the 19th, earlier this year at the nice. old San Diego. Like um, the, the 25 people. Who were there the young people it was interesting because they didn't know these some of them like jim brown and by the end of the play they were googling information so i realized right. i didn't need to say as much about who they were just yeah. on the character and the story and people would figure it out so then we came back to la we did another reading at the said rogue machine and, and that one was kind of like a packed house everyone really loved it i had tightened it up a little bit more and that turned into the the, the first production, um, I guess that would be 20, 2013, uh, mm -hmm. the first production of the play, which is actually the kind of the thing that dragged me, you know, kicking and streaming and screaming uh, back, back into Hollywood. So yeah. yeah, like the, 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 my journalism and my reporting, that was kind of like the fuel in that engine, you know, mm -hmm. for, for what I, for what I do. So like, one night in Miami got you the opportunity at Pixar. Have you made the connection for yourself between pursuing something you were very passionate about and it leading to other opportunities? Like, are you happy that you pursued it even with the huge risk of like not having the rights to the music and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, my whole career is, I, I have a pretty high risk, high reward career, which I'm mm -hmm. very happy in. Like I'm, it's not for even, I think the mistake some people make is that they assume everyone in our industry, so to speak, we do the same thing. We want the same things. There's all different kinds of ways to have a career, you know, yeah. and I understand. I will never question. We Every individual has to make the decisions that are right for them. For me, I any time that I'm not innately passionate and excited about a subject as a writer or director, I don't do a good job. Mm -hmm. Like, I basically can't fake it. You know what I mean? And and you know what? Fake is the wrong word because I have friends who are masters at examining an existing script, pointing out, figuring out what's wrong and making it better. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they can assess the problems in the script, kind of deconstruct the reasons why. Um, and, and, and like by rewriting 20, 30%, just escalate it like in a, that doesn't really work for me because if I see a script and things don't work, I just want to rewrite the whole thing as my script. And so it doesn't, I, I can help. Like I do rooms where I help other writers, but yeah. it's more like ideas and questions that I'm asking, trying to help them mine what they're trying to do. I'm not really a good punch up guy. You, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that yep. comes from the fact that like, I'm so, driven by a borderline obsessive passion about whatever subject I'm into on any given day of the week. I can seem a little bit schizophrenic because they're like, it's, it's such a, the most difficult question people ask me is like, well, what genre, what this? And I'm like, what? Like, I don't even think of it that way. I'm, I was just as passionate about writing on soul and direct co-directing soul, which mm -hmm. is an animated film about a jazz musician as I was writing one night in Miami, you know? Right. I was just excited and passionate about Miles Morales, a superhero, as I was soul. Like every, if it's a Western, I'm, I'm, there's something, you know, I look at what I, what I like and I like yeah. all different kinds of films. So as a writer and a director, I am, at least in my delusional mind, I see myself as capable of making all different kinds of films. And mm -hmm. I don't really want to be defined by any one. Now in the, in our business, that can be a detriment. You know what I mean? Because yeah it's actually more lucrative to be in a box, especially if that's a box that's a, a, a profitable box. So yeah. like, if you're seen as like a writer or director of this, a writer or director of that, you know, mm -hmm. you your money in the bank, especially if you've proven yourself. 
The yeah. fact that like, I zig and zag, like I don't like, I don't even like doing the same thing too many times because I don't want to just get people coming to me with that kind of stuff. Like if I'm mm -hmm. being, if I'm being perfectly honest, like outside of Spider-Verse, like I don't, I don't, I probably don't see myself doing another animated film anytime soon, mm -hmm. you know, if ever, if, if ever, because um, I, I'm drawn to the story. I'm not drawn to just like a company or, or like, I, I don't really see that happening. Right. Um, you know, I have one, I have a history project. I've, um, I've been writing for a couple of years and I'm on the final stages of that. Um, and I've enjoyed writing about history, but, but like when I look at the next couple of things that I'm really interested in doing, they're incredible diversions from everything mm -hmm. that I've done before. And that's kind of like just me. It's just yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to be in a box. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's really hard to not kind of like eat that meal because again, it gives you a stability Yeah. that, that um, I've, I guess because I've never really had it. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty stable now because I've had successes, but, yeah. uh, but I still kind of like to exist in this um, high risk kind of high reward mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like I, I don't, yeah, it's hard to, I mean, that's for my therapist to kind of, you know, figure out, but, but um, that's just me. But what's interesting about what you're saying is that, you know, I was in a conversation with a writer once and, you know, some writers get the advice to specialize in one kind of writing, but he was saying that people of color don't have the privilege and, and have to be able to write multiple uh, dis disciplines and multiple disciplines. What do you think about that? I don't know. I mean, I know, I know examples that would prove out that argument, but I know examples mm -hmm. that would also contradict that argument. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There are some pretty phenomenal, um, you know, black writers and, and writers of color in general who, who are specialists and, and it's mm -hmm. been proven very, you know, from, from horror to, you know what I mean? To there's all kinds of like genre specialists who are people of color. Um, so, so I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think you can, you can find an example to prove out just about any theory, but that's yeah. just because if you poll 10 or 20 writers or directors, you're going to hear 10 completely different stories, how they got into the business, what they do, how they yeah. do it. You know, uh, it, there's there's no one way. There there really isn't right. any one way. And and I have my own kind of like my sets of personal rules that I adhere to. But I hesitate to even like say what they are out loud to anyone because I don't want someone to think if you just do that, it's going to work for you because it might be right. the opposite. It might prove disastrous for you. So mm -hmm. I've found that like you know, people are speaking towards the element of like their experience that have been successful to you. If I'm speaking yeah. towards my experience, what's been successful for me has been like never committing to an overall deal, always doing something different, always being, but it's like, that could be completely disastrous for, for another person, but it's yeah. just, you know, it's just what's worked out for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke with, um, Frank Abney about working on Soul and how he had to advocate for keeping a dap in as an animator. What are some like things that black creatives have to deal with once a black project gets greenlit, but there's this back and forth on authenticity with people from not from the culture? Well, I mean, it's funny because I mean, obviously I know Frank really well and mm -hmm. that dap was something we, we did. I was there. Like I was uh, the, the mm -hmm. dap was, I, I was the, I was the co-sign on the dap right. <laughs> in, in the room. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's nice to have us at every different level. You, yeah. you know, I mean, not just this every group. It's nice to have people of different backgrounds, not just in one area, but like, yeah. you know, all the way up the the food chain. But that being said, understand, you know, animation is is it's really collaborative. You know, mm -hmm. it's really it, it's so interesting with an animated film how if you do a good job, the audience doesn't know what they're even seeing. They don't like one of the things we've talked about a lot is that like do people know the scale of these movies that right. these films are as big as Star Wars or the biggest Marvel like we had a crew of a thousand people on on yes. Spider Verse and in animation I think a good animation um, situation you incur these thousand people aren't a thousand automatons they're a thousand artists yes in their own right who have very strong ideas and very strong opinions. The thing that I would always encourage is don't be motivated by fear. Like if you have mm. a strong idea, you got to 
It's doing no one any favors to keep your discomfort or your idea to yourself and just share it with your buddies at the cafeteria. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and you see a lot of that. It's like, oh, let's all get together at the cafeteria and talk shit. But like, you got, it sounds simple, but you got to speak up, you yeah. know, put that out there. Because in my experience, it's just like, I think at least on the artist side, people do want to make good films. They, they yeah. do want to make the best version of the film possible. And sometimes your idea, they might not understand it. So a lot of it is also like how you bring it up. If, if we're coming from this place of like, we're already wounded, everything feels yeah. like an attack. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like how, it's like enthusiasm and like bringing up these ideas that are important to you and pitching them and understand everyone's not going to get through or else right. no movie would ever get made. But advocate, make a case for those ideas. That's honestly been so much of the key to my success in animation is that right. I will really advocate for an idea. And and you know what? If if the group decides that's not the way to go, I then get behind whatever we decide to do. Mm -hmm. You know, because ultimately the a good movie helps us all. But yeah. I did, you know, and you can't win, you can't get every single thing you want to do in there. Cause again, it is a real, real collaboration. Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, when I came in on board at, at Pixar on, on Soul, like, mm -hmm. I, I remember, and I don't think it's wrong just to, like, say this out loud, but I, but I remember, like, being very vocal about, you know, there weren't a ton of Black animators there, but yeah. there were more who were coming on board. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was like, you know, I want, like, every Black animator here to be working on Soul. Yeah. Now, that sounds like a simple thing, but... Think about it from the animator's perspective. Some mm -hmm. black animators are like, wait a minute, now you're doing this black film, so now they want me on it. Yeah. So people actually have a legitimate reason both to want to be on the film and yeah. also to want to stay away from the film. Because yeah. it's like, oh, you want me on the black film? And and I would speak to people directly, you know, like in that cafeteria and be like, look, <laughs> I, need, I, I need you. I need your voice in here. So like, Put that aside, and, right. and, and I mean, it's, it's always positive. That's the thing. Yeah, so, you know, when we started, uh, we started two cultural trusts on Soul. One mm -hmm. was um, outside artists that we brought in that we mm -hmm. would screen um, the film for. Um, you know, everyone from freaking like Herbie Hancock to like Quest. Like it was great. It was like artists. But then we had an internal culture trust, and that was just black Pixar employees. Yeah. Now, the internal culture trust, the first few meetings, it was actually kind of laughable how little people spoke. You're right. Yes. You know what I mean? It was just like <laughs> a lot of kind of that. And and one person who was in it, Robert Graham Jones, who's actually a black editor. Like, that's mm -hmm. the thing. Like, he should be kind of a Robert Graham Jones should be a household name. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been at Pixar for Jesus, I think at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean? He's like a, a black editor who's who's been doing it at a high level for decades. And and people in our own black people in that the animation industry should all know who this guy's name is because he's right. at the top of his damn game. So mm -hmm. Robert, you know, being older than me, he was always a cool guy to like, and we're still friends now. He was a cool guy to talk to. And it was like, after those first couple of meetings, I was like, dude, why won't anyone speak? So like, <laughs> a lot of... My, my, you know, my job, it, it's not just about writing and directing, but a lot of your responsibilities as a co-director is in the most, your most important impact sometimes is in those moments where it's like, yeah. what can we do to get this group to open up? Because this group, the outside consultants are great. Great yeah. names, they're, they're talented, world famous artists, but it's, they're not the ones making the film. Right. It's the internal culture trust that's like, we're empowered to impact the making of this film in a way. And it's like, we really need to like all, no matter what's happened in the past, you know, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, because they've probably been empowered before and that's yes, probably why they I, weren't talking. I, I get it. I, I totally get both urges. You know what yeah. I mean? I get the urge just like, this is an opportunity. And I get the urge like, I've heard this before. But, <laughs> you know, dare I say like, we have to, I guess, your your naivete has to come to the fore and you have to like you have to kind of go on faith and keep trying even if you've been burned 
Yeah. Because they don't know me. I'm I'm black, but I'm new there. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's just like, great, who's this dude? I think over time, of course, everyone not only got to know me, but came to like really respect me and, and understand that I wasn't full of shit, you know? <laughs> but it could have gone either way. I could have right. totally been a guy who was full of shit, who's like, I'm just here to get a check, you know, da 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 because that's yeah. real too. But I was like, mm -hmm. I was I was incredibly um, invested in soul. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Especially during on the writing side with Mike Jones and Pete Doctor, as mm -hmm. I started inserting like elements of my own life into the script. Right. It suddenly became like, this movie's gotten really personal for me. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, it was that, but that was, I think, cracking that open because it was a group that they all worked there. They all knew each other, but they didn't talk a lot. So yeah. I, I think there's some inter things that have been internalized because animation has been what it's been. It's been around for a hundred years and it's only in like the past 10 or 15 that mm -hmm. any real inroads of artists of color have, have really popped up. Like someone else was the one who told me I was the first black director of anything at a at Pixar yeah. or, or Disney. And I was like, well, that can't be right. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, snap. Like, that's like I was embarrassed for everyone else. But at the same time, it's not right to kind of like then mm -hmm. saddle the folks at Pixar and me mm -hmm. with making this movie with the burden of all the awful things that might have been done over a hundred years. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I was born, they weren't born when Song of the South came out. So like, don't, don't hold that one against me. You know, <laughs> right. you know like, like that has nothing to do with us. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Like the past should inform you, but, but don't let it be, I don't think people should let it be a hindrance where yeah. the past, you're not willing to even go forward. It's like, I saw Pixar as a house of master storytelling. Mm -hmm. I see myself as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Why would I not want to try to be a master? Why would I not try to tell the best stories possible with the right. best people in the game? Mm -hmm. You know, it was the same yeah. thing with Spider-Verse. It was like, I love the Miles Morales character, but it was the irreverence of the storytelling that Lord Miller, you know, have fostered in their careers. It's like, I want to work with people who are fellow artists. I call them fellow travelers. Mm -hmm. who are trying to do things differently and right. not trying to be put into boxes all the time. Mm -hmm. I feel like that goes um, well into like, I've heard you speak about people like Spike Lee using his power for good, advocating for black journalists, which is the field you came from interviewing mm -hmm. him. Uh, how, how have you implemented those observations of black creatives demanding representation into how you operate as a writer and a leader? And what have you decided is your purpose in regards to blackness and our progression in creativity? Yeah. I mean, there's a few things like, look, I'm, I like, I've become as I, I like to see myself as also like a supporter of, of black artists, yeah. you know, in, in ways, in, in multiple ways. Like, you know, I, I started, fun it's, it's interesting like i still write plays i still write theater but theater isn't something that i need from a monetary standpoint you know what i mean like and i remember how important it was to me to get my first commissions someone just like paying me to write a play yeah. was like at a certain point in my life in my early career not only were, were those first dollars like pivotal to me like keeping the lights on mm -hmm. and keep food on the table but it was a, a boost to my um, my 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 mo my confidence that that I just needed. So you know, I, I started funding at uh, you know a, a couple of initiatives where you know it's grants for new career um, black playwrights um, mm -hmm. where I where I started giving out you know grants for them. And in most cases, it's the first time they've gotten a grant yeah. or, or a commission, and it's just like. Right. I don't care what kind of play they're writing. I just care that it's like a black playwright because I know how important that that first investment in someone's you know career um, has has can be, and I know yeah. how important it can be for me. You know, if I'm being completely honest, you know, I I like to spend a lot of my time in the lab making the thing. Mm -hmm. um, part of your job, particularly as a director, is when the film comes out, you got to promote it. You know, yeah. and um, Truth be told, it's like I, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I gotta like work up the energy to to do press, um, and I and I struggle with that, especially as a former journalist. So like you know, like when people ask me leading questions, I just like I know what they're trying to do, and and I kind of pull back a little bit. Yeah. But despite that, 
I um I always make it key to make myself more available to black reporters and journalists. Who, yeah. Like I'm not doing everyone's podcast. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like I, I really am. I try my best to like get out of my comfort zone and, and mm-hmm. actually have on, honest conversations and really, you know, speak honestly. You know, I speak a lot to students, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I always kind of have a rule when I'm speaking to students, including black college students, you know, mm-hmm. like I did a talk with a group of Howard students a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, no, you know, you, we can either have the cameras off and not record and I can tell you the truth or we can mm-hmm. record and you know, and, and the students 100% of the time want the cameras off and we have I think, conversations that really help them. Yeah. Um, and honestly, that's kind of the motivation I've had for um, deciding to, to to teach next year. Because I mean, yeah. schedule is not going to be any less crazy. It's quite the opposite. It's the craziest mm-hmm. it's ever been. But I'm still going to fly in to Ann Arbor one day a week because I really do feel like a certain social responsibility to yeah. Rather than just complain about how things are, to to do what I can to to try to at least open people's minds to different ways of doing things and mm-hmm. be some kind of positive um, um, impact. And and also like when I see something phenomenal by a new artist of color, mm-hmm. I try to either reach out directly or find some way to you know very under the radar kind of offer some kind of support. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not unique in that. A lot of people do that. I think a mm-hmm. lot more people than than you know would do that. Right. It was funny because someone had reached out to me recently asking me to um, if I would be interested in accepting a something. It, it was like a, a position at a university tied to a, another a black celebrity. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I can't because I'm busy. But even if I weren't, like, I don't. I'm not the one who needs that. Yeah. You know? And like, so and if I can't, if I'm not accepting it. I try to direct them to people who could use it. You know what I mean? And um, yeah. so, you know, and those are those are the things that I'm that I'm able to do. But it, it's an important part of what I do. I think it's mm-hmm. it's interesting bringing it back to one night in Miami. Um, and um, I definitely personally fell more into. I told you Sam Cooke was the way in right. for me. And so much of what Sam Cooke did that inspired me was that he operated behind the scenes and below the radar. Mm-hmm. And he was implementing institu- institutional change from inside. And yeah. I think that can be very powerful, but it can also be very thankless work to do. Mm-hmm. And I've been a real big committed person to trying to, when I am working, I mean, I'm independent, but when I'm working with anyone or working for anyone, I'm working within the constraints of that institution. And right. I really try to support change from the inside in yeah. everything that I do because I've already seen that impact in places that I've been and in, in things that I've worked on. And mm-hmm. you have the ability to enact a lot more change than you realize, again, if you speak up. And if right. you speak up in a way that's coming from a place that like, we all need each other, man. We got to figure out a way to work together. Yeah. Uh, and, and ultimately at the end of the day, I just want to make, I want everyone to be committed to like making better art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just want to make better art. And, and I want us all to get a chance to make good art. Yeah, I will say with you know me doing this podcast, uh, YouTube channel for five years, I did sense your willingness to to do the interview with me. Like I was actually going to say it before we started, but I, I'll say it now that I appreciate your willingness. I could sense the willingness because sometimes I can tell when people don't really want to do it. <laughs> so um, and then another thing is like as an intro- introvert myself, I realized through my YouTube channel, particularly when I was doing talking to the camera, that my introversion of, you know, things draining energy from me was like not just interacting with people, but just putting on because I'm like, I'm staring at a camera. Why am I tired? And it's like, oh, the putting on is what makes me tired. Yeah, you understand what that's like. And I'm very yeah. much in that way. Like I, you know, we're, we're in the middle of award season. So we're doing lots of interviews about Spider-Verse. But trust yeah. me when I say that when it's all done, I'm, I'm I vanish. Cause I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, that's it. It's done. And then I'm like, you'll see me when the next thing comes out. Yeah. Um, Cause it, it's hard to push. I, I equate what I do is like, I push big boulders up a hill. Yeah. And as soon as I finish, I got to go down the hill and push another boulder up. I know the boulders I have lined up one, two, right. three, four. I know what they are. Mm-hmm. The public doesn't know what they are, 
but I'm just like, I got to roll up my sleeves and just like push, push, push that, um, that next boulder. And there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to get it, get it up the hill, but I got to try, you know, and, and yeah. that's, what it, that's what it feels like. It, it's very mm-hmm. much, um, I once had a great mentor, um, when I first got into the writer's guild and, mm-hmm. and I, I, I quote him all the time. Cause he was like, he said, the key to success in this business is a Venn diagram. It's three circles. He is like, it's talent, it's luck, and it's perseverance. And yeah. All you need is two to survive and make it. And I was like, well, you know, I may not always be the most talented writer, and but I feel like I have more perseverance than anyone, mm-hmm. like than almost anyone I've ever met. And mm-hmm. proof of that is that my career didn't really pick up until about 15 years after I should have quit. But I was just kind of still going, you know, yeah. not being around, like still pounding away. Just because as an adult, it's a thin line between persist and pivot. Yeah, and you don't know I, which one yeah. to do. I got two adult kids now, you know, so that's like, yeah, I had like went through, you know, a lot in in life, yeah. and it was like I was living. Didn't stop me from living my life. I was living my life, but it's like, wow, it was uh, the perseverance. So sometimes. I do some really great shit. Sometimes I guess I'm lucky, but I'm always going to be like perseverant and just yeah. like being in there. And and that's really what um what keeps me in the game is is just really tenacious when it comes to chasing stories that I want to tell and trying to get them out to to my audience cuz that's really what it is. It's not it's not an audience, it's what I feel is my audience. Right. <laughs> and across the Spider-Verse you got to take a deep dive into specificity, like the Sham God jersey and Jeff's shirt. What do you love about providing the opportunity for Black audiences to see nuance in our stories and how it doesn't actually detract from other cultures being able to enjoy the project? Yeah, well, it will never detract as long as the story itself is good. Right. You no, know, like I used to get, I, I actually enjoy, and one of the things I like in theater is when you have a new play come up, you often do a Q&A with the playwright. And, you know, you're just sitting there in the audience and 500 people are just peppering you with questions. A lot of playwrights don't like that. I love those questions because it's a conversation. And it's also it's a conversation in a room. So it's like not being broadcast because everything is broadcast. People have they can get to go and then nitpick. Yeah. One line and then turn your meaning into something else later. When it's in yeah. the room, you get my meaning and we understand one another. And mm-hmm. it was early on. It was a production of One Night in Miami in denver it was in denver because i remember the audience the audience was like overwhelmingly white and, <laughs> and during the q a the audience loved the play yeah and um one audience member very earnestly he was like how does it feel for you as a black playwright to have your work be consumed by an audience that looks like this um and i said well i said did you all enjoy the play and of course they clapped because they that's why they stayed for the q a I said, right. at any time, I said, I think I said, like, does any anyone here like to show, like, does anyone here like to show The Sopranos? Just clap. I said, any time watching The Sopranos, did you think, well, like, how am I supposed to be invo- under- into this if I'm not Italian? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're just enjoying it because it's good. And it's speaking to universal themes. Because right. at the end of the day, no matter what our unique niche experiences are, I'm always after unearthing some universal truth in every story that I tell. That's really mm-hmm. kind of like, if, if I have a thing that I do, that's really what I'm trying to do. You know, no matter what the story is, no matter how specific it is, what's really exciting is that turn where it's like, and what is the universal truth that I'm trying to uncover right. in, in this in this piece? And so regardless of what it is, regardless of the race or gender or whatever, if it's just well told, everyone's going to be there for it. You know, yeah. like at a certain point, um, look at, look at into the Spider-Verse, look at the, the mm-hmm. first Spider-Verse film, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like, and that's the thing, people, people have revision. We love revisionist history. Like I, I'm old enough that I remember when The Lion King came out in movie theaters, the animated Mm -hmm. film, The Lion King. And Mm -hmm. it was so funny because leading up to The Lion King, a lot of people were not excited about that. I'm talking black people. It was Mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. We've been getting all these Disney princesses. 
we finally get to Africa and there's no princess. It's just a bunch of animals. Okay. Right. And I think Pocahontas might have come out the same year. So it was like right. the princess. So it was like people were kind of like, why are we all animals? You know? And <laughs> so Africa is animals. And then the Lion King came out. And that shit was good. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And like right. once it's good right. and well done, it all kind of like goes out the window. Right. You know? And and I've talked about this in other podcasts and other interviews, and is that like people can only start focusing on and nitpicking that stuff. Yeah. Once the story is falling apart and it's just not good, it's not yeah. entertaining. It's just waving a finger in your face. If yeah. you're just focused as an artist on doing something like really, really dope, then hell, I mean, it could be a person who hates you, hates your race, hates whatever, and they're still going to have to be like, God damn it, but this is like, this is like really dope. That That's what I like about Ali Wong and like always be my maybe beef is that the story is there, but it's full of Asian stuff. Yeah. But but the story is still there and it's not, yeah. it's not finger whacking. Yeah. And, and I've enjoyed stuff by creators of all different kinds of, you know, and also understand that like bringing it all the way back to growing up in Brooklyn. OK, yeah. most I'd say I don't want to say, you know, well, yeah, I could think I could say most. I'd say most young black men in New York at that time, we were all doing the same thing every Saturday morning. And that mm -hmm. was watching Run Run Shaw Kung Fu movies mm -hmm. to the point that you it's embarrassing. But you'd see brothers walking around in Kung Fu gear a lot of the times with the little tower ninja tabby boots just looking ridiculous. But like. <laughs> It's it's bad dubs, but like, cause kung fu was just cool. Yeah, you know, it was just so goddamn cool. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the those those from from Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan to like all the Run Run Shaw stuff. You know, the uh, martial arts movies. At no point will did, did any of us stop and say like, well, we can't. I'm not enjoying this because. We're not, it's not, it's like, no, it's specific to a different film industry, a different culture, you know, mm -hmm. a different, it inspired a generation of us to take martial arts. I took Taekwondo. Like we all got into martial arts. We all, mm -hmm. it was just like, but it starts from this place of like, it was just dope. Yeah. And if it's dope, then everyone is going to yeah. go along and they're going to kind of absorb that specificity almost through osmosis. But, and it's something that I also got from theater in that, look, and the American theater is largely, um, the audience is largely white. Yes. Um, and Which is why I like, I appreciate Central Theater Group for the Black Knights. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's great. And But but it's like, there's just two things to keep in mind, though. It's like, one is that, like, when I'm writing a play, even if it's, and it's, it's, an, it's an ethos I bring to filmmaking, too. Mm -hmm. Even if there's just, like, one Black person in the audience, there's some kind of like, I don't, it's not even mischievous. I think there's just a part of me that wants that one black person in the audience to know that I see them. Yeah. <laughs> in, in my work, you know what I mean? Yeah. Some of my little things that I do yeah. are for, they're specifically for us. They're yeah. specifically for like, you know, that one person who's my age group, who's from Brooklyn, you know, will mm -hmm. just like pick up on that. And I actually love things like that. You know, I, I love to do that. And it's not detracting from anyone's enjoyment of the story. You know, you right. can call it whatever you want. You could call it a dog whistle, you know, but as but as much as I can, I kind of love doing that because I've I've sat through productions of readings or productions of my own play where like there was two, three black people in the audience and they came up to me and they pointed out the exact thing that I kind of <laughs> did that was specifically for them. And the second thing is in theater, people talk so much about like wanting to invite in new audiences, but mm -hmm. they, it's like, I don't, I always felt frustrated by like, what exactly does that mean? You, yeah. you know what I mean? Like how the theater audience is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, theater is highly subsidized and nonprofit and mm -hmm. bringing in a new audience to me is like, you know, trying to get rid of the audience that's there because they're obviously well many people who support the arts. They're yeah. important. But it's like, but how do you open the doors and get 
other people to also be able to enjoy this yes. thing. Part of it is about the art that we put up on the stage, making sure it's something that an audience can enjoy. Part yes. of it is developing a little bit more patience for someone who's new to this medium because I was the worst offender the first time I sat in a theater. I almost interrupted the play because I was so accustomed to television that right. I, I, you know, I grabbed some like gravel from the set in the front row and like threw it on the, the guy who was, because I wanted to get his attention, but it wasn't like, I want to mess this play up. I was just used to the screen and it was like yeah. right there. Can he see me? Like I kept trying to get in the guy's eye line, you know, and looking at him and, and the actor to his credit was just like, professional about it but i thought yeah. that was fascinating but that's ultimately i'm who they want yeah I'm the person who might even behave a little badly the first mm -hmm. time I'm there but it's because my mind is being blown <laughs> and when people's minds are being blown it's not manifested necessarily the way you want it to be or the way you expect it to be yeah it's kind of like oh shit i'm being rewired and changed like bear with me while i adjust to this new mm -hmm. thing that is that is blowing my mind and yeah. the reason it blew my mind is because I wasn't taught it. I wasn't a theater kid. Mm -hmm. I, it's like I'm I'm that new audience. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the um uh Five Heartbeats documentary where they talked about how that the executives tried to take out the getting saved scene and then the, the I song scene? The, I, mean, I love the Five Heartbeats, but I haven't seen the documentary. Yeah, like the one where they're in the bedroom putting together the song with the pieces of paper. The executives tried to take that out, and then at the end when he got saved, they tried to take that out. And it's like those are the best scenes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got those are for us. <laughs> who, who directed the documentary? Who's it from? I think. Probably Robert Townsend did it. Oh, um, I gotta check it out. Do you remember doing the pandemic? Robert Townsend was doing a lot, like with UMC. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I found it around there. And I'm gonna make a yeah. note. And look it up. What are three movies you would recommend to my audience, and why? Oh man, that's a. You mean just like in general, or like? Yeah, animated? it doesn't have to be animated. Oh, um, Jesus! I mean. I have like a few classics that I kind of just adore. They can be classics. animated wise. I love Watership Down, the yep. the nineteen eighties version of it. That's pretty dark and terrifying for a lot of kids, but it also kind of shows what animation is capable of. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Unforgiven, uh, the Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman western, which mm -hmm. I think is just like one of the 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 best films um, ever ever made. Mm -hmm. um, Eddie Murphy and, and Dan Aykroyd in Trading Places, which I yes. think is not only one of the best comedies ever made, but I think one of like the best. And again, like by today's standards, I'm sure a lot of that movie might be offensive to people. But man, Trading Places, when it came out, was yeah. like revelatory funny. Like, mm -hmm. and, and it's also fun rewatching it now and seeing actors in small parts who are now famous today, like Giancarlo right. Rizzito is just like one of the criminals in jail with Eddie Murphy as a young man. Like just mm -hmm. seeing people in the background who were like move movie stars now, but on a base level, I just think it's one of the best um, comedy movies of all time. If someone was producing a documentary about you, what things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in journalism and entertainment? Hmm. I think the fact that I'm a bird watcher. <laughs> uh, you know, some of the unusual things that I, and also just how mundane life is when you're an artist, you, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'd really want to focus on, on, on that. Like I, I have like very mundane kind of interest and really get joy and, and, and simple things. And, and I have a pretty tight, close group of friends who have always supported me and, mm -hmm. you know, like you're there, there is much, uh, uh, a part of my story as anything else. Uh, I want to thank you for sitting down with me and allowing me to highlight you. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Citadel and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace.